Hi, Dr. Dan Purser here, danpursermd.com. We're going to try and change the math on your health or maybe the math on your family's health, your children's health today. I know a lot of you um, fans and followers have been uh, waiting for me to do this this long, long-awaited video on on genetics and um, genetics with children and inflammation and vaccines and things like that. Let's see what we can figure out. I've got um, Dr. Mike Clark from from Austin up here today flew up so we could do this video and and work together on this. This is Mike. Hi, I'm glad to be talking to you today. <laughs> Definitely glad to be here working with Dr. Purser. Thanks, Mike. No, I'm glad you, you flew up. Wow, what an honor. So is it possible to know early if your child is at genetic risk for autism? Uh, we're going to discuss these genetic risks and show things that can cause increased inflammation with vaccinations, things like that, maybe give you some ideas on ways you can approach vaccinations and, and uh, let you make better decisions as parents. Who am I? I'm Dan Purser. I'm an MD. Occasionally, I think I'm a naturopath. I've done a lot of endocrinology research. Currently, I'm cosmetic surgery group. Um, hard to miss this office. It <laughs> looks yeah. like a sur uh, plastic surgery office, doesn't it? Yeah, beautiful office. Thank you. <laughs> Deal, I deal with complex wound issues and get to the root causes. Uh, I have a practice in London, Utah, world educator, speaker, all that kind of stuff, also an author. So my legal protection, this video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Please don't use the inform information contained in this course to treat yourself. Sorry I have to go through all this, but please consult with a knowledgeable physician in your area before starting any treatment as might be possibly be suggested in this course. I'll not be held responsible if something goes wrong. Hard to really for anything to go wrong here because most of this you deal with naturally and with vitamins, things like that to, to deal with these errors. But anyway, be careful and thanks. So Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I have an interesting background. I was in the military first, a uh, Vietnam veteran. Wow. And uh, spent a couple tours over there, one in Vietnam, one in Cambodia. Uh, later on, I spent about 10 years in the military, was the Green Beret type guy back in the old days. I believe it. I'd call snake eaters type stuff. Uh, then I became an attorney. <coughs> Excuse me. And a, You're a recovering <laughs> attorney, right? I'm a recovering attorney, yes. <laughs> and I spent about 10 years, but I was defense counsel, so I uh, pretty much did a lot of jury trials, um, defending a lot of people, uh, some wrongfully accused, some rightfully accused. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we won't and, discuss that. No, we won't discuss that. <laughs> Then after then I became very interested oh. in the in the uh, medical society mostly because my mom got Alzheimer's and I was kind of concerned I couldn't really figure out what was going on with her and back in those days we really didn't know much about Alzheimer's anyway we uh, we're, we're learning a lot more about it now so I became very interested in the medical field and I uh, eventually ended up opening uh, five different medical clinics doing bioidentical hormones natural weight loss um, I've sold all those clinics in October of 2015 so. It's kind of interesting what happened was I was retired, supposedly. I'm not, I'm not definitely at that age of retirement. You're about the least retired guy I know. Yeah. Good grief. <laughs> well, yeah. I, well, I got introduced to genetic testing, and I said, wow, this stuff is really uh, interesting and really cool because a lot of information, when we treated people before, we didn't have all the information we needed to really help people. So sometimes we couldn't because we didn't have the information. Same issues we have. Like when I see someone with low testosterone, I'm like, why does this 23-year-old kid have low testosterone when you have a brain injury or pituitary damage or yeah, I yeah. get it. Yeah. And why are they depressed? Why are they anxious? Uh, so we did the best we could tired, uh, sleep, all these type of things. And now of course it's hitting kids a lot more than it used to. So a lot of reasons out there we'll probably talk as we go along. But so I, so I became interested in genetic testing. So I got interested. Of course I tested all my families. I tested my grandkids, all my kids, uh, tested everybody I could think of actually. And I've had a lot of experience testing people since then. So I just think it's great. It's a great source of information. Thank you. Yeah, and you and I have connected because every time I go to a conference, you're there and we start talking and, and we've just become really good friends through all this. I'm really impressed with Mike. He knows a lot more about this than, than even I do, especially the, um, the approach we're going to talk about today. And he's kind of turned me on to some of these concepts. I really appreciate Mike. He's just a good friend. And and uh, reminds me of my my cousins when I was a kid growing up in Oklahoma, and they went off to the war. And yeah, so Mike's my bud. So these are some of the genetic SNPs or errors we're going to discuss today: MTRRA66G, MTHFD1, MTHFRC677T, GAD1, COMT, um, MAOB, COMT. There's two versions of it. There's actually about eight versions of COMT: SLC1981, Fuller2. 
IL-5, ADRA 2A, sorry, this is long, HLA, DQA2, CTH, ATG12, no, sorry, let me go back to that. If you want to take a screenshot of it, there it is. We're going to cover all those. So what did we use? The um, Dan Perch MD Developmental Nutrigenomic Panel. Uh, it's easy. Just swab the child's cheek and then package it and mailed it. It's all included if you purchase. If you ever want one of these, you can get one. Um, you can, and it, they're inexpensive through my website. Uh, some of you are going to maybe have that question. And then we can discuss it. Or Mike will discuss it with you and his team, um, especially if I get overwhelmed by all you guys. That's a really good option. Um, and I'll probably discuss a lot of these cases with Mike myself. So um, I don't accept insurance. I don't think Mike does either. There's just no way to, to, they won't pay for this. So, and if you want to do the testing, it's simple to do. Want, let's look at the video or, or why don't you watch this video first before we um, decide if you want to do the testing or not. Uh, before digging further in the video, you have to watch our two uh, genetic primer videos, one and two. Um, Mike shot um, number two and I shot number one. They're short, they're very informative, can be found on my website, danpersonmd.com. These will explain the concepts and ter terminology we use today. So it'll kind of help you. So stop here, go watch those videos, circle back, and then uh, read all this video back in and, and come to this point and move forward. This is a really awesome website by Cheryl Atkinson, who's a reporter. Her medical vaccine links, you can go to this website and read all about uh, look at all the articles she's done on this. She used to work, I think it was for CBS, and um, is just a really excellent reporter. And her interview with the FDA, people that ran the, um, the vaccine research is outstanding. Also, um, Mike turned me on to this, to this book, How to End the Autism Epidemic. You can get it on Amazon. I, again, I don't have any involvement with it other than it's a great book on, on um, on vaccines and the autism epidemic and a, a lot of uh, good research information in there. So make sure if you don't have it, grab it if you're really curious about this stuff. I'm gonna talk about a couple of supplements today among many. Uh, Nutrascriptors is one company that carries a, a number of the supplements that Mike and I'll discuss uh, in this video. Um, I don't even know if we discussed my arginic supplements like our MTH4 Support Plus, but um, just giving you a heads up on all that. Mike and I, neither one, I think, believe in Band-Aids. Um, better to dig deep and find out what's really going on, like giving amphetamine for chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, what's the actual cause of the fatigue? That's what I try and teach physicians. That's what I'm gonna try and teach you so you'll know what, what options are out there. Um, we've been practicing root cause medicine for a long time, for probably 15 years here in uh, Linden, where my practice is. I, look, I have to look for root causes in the cases I take on. And uh, that means looking at genetics, looks at looking at intracellular or vitamins, minerals. You guys know my spiel and what I do. And looking at hormone issues, things like that. Um, from here on out, you're gonna, we're gonna be looking at the root cause of fatigue. Um, this is also for physicians who are watching it, so kind of to, uh, carry that message there too. We always, uh, doctors should dive or dig deeper to really question the why. What, why is this going on? Why is this happening? Why does this 18-year-old boy have bad depression? Why does this 17-year-old girl have immense fatigue? And why is this 12-year-old um, kid autistic? So this was a really interesting study for physicians in 1998. Uh, Stan, uh, Stanford published this in the Journal of the American Medical Association. They looked at um, more than 1,000 patients as they were leaving doctors' offices, and what they found uh, they interviewed them and questioned them um, what more could their doctor be doing for them and 69 percent wanted more natural therapy options that was 1998 so that was 21 years ago if they repeated it now it'd probably be 89 percent or 98 percent when you think yeah it's lot. pretty high for natural alternatives yeah a lot higher so in, um i don't know this is an interesting um it's the number two thing on google when you look up mthfr that comes up on google search um the number one URL is from the Cleveland Clinic, Kara Singh, Dr. Kara Singh, an MD, PhD geneticist said, if you don't have a high homocysteine level, you don't need to worry, you don't need to treat the MTHFR, you don't need to worry about the genetics, you don't need to look at anything else. And I really disagree with this, so I'm gonna, we'll prove the point today that just, she was wrong or he was wrong. Um, yeah, that's pretty true. Never seen a spectra cell, which is that intracellular micronutrient panel 
Uh, we do. Confusing the big boys say the future is genetic medicine, but then they say it's not. So which is it kind of? I mean, well, I think it is. Yeah, I don't have any question that, well, part of the future anyway is genetic medicine. Uh, we hopefully are all aware of all the melodies that all our kids are facing as well as adults. And then we have the food supplies out there. Um, we have everything that they're being exposed to, the chemicals, the pesticides, the herbicides. What genetic testing, which I particularly like, of course, is information. It gives mm -hmm. you information. And what we're talking about, we're going to be talking about, is uh, nutrigenomics, which is what genes, how do you nourish them? How do you make them healthy? Right. And how do you get around the error that's, that's occurred in this child or this adult or whatever? And you, the workaround is usually nutrition, usually the correct, correct kind of vitamins. So, you know, I kind of wonder, it's okay to do certain type of genetic medicine and testing, but not what the average primary care can do. And this, and we're going to kind of dig into that today. So, so our genetic testing gives you a major plus. Yeah. We sitting right here by me. Um, <laughs> you can, you can talk to Mike Clark if need be and get his opinion. Um, uh, or, um, uh, or I'll call him sometimes and talk to him and find out what he's thinking about him. One of my patients that I get tested. So, and the test is super easy to perform fast 10 days. So here we go. This is a one year old versus his genetics versus a vaccine case example. And uh, Mike and I are going to talk about this for the next little while. So, this was the signs and symptoms that I understand normal male babies so far. Our brother who's 15 became autistic after receiving a full vaccine load. That's what the parents believe. Um, guess what? Uh, the FDA um, now says this can happen. You'll read it in the Cheryl Atkinson interview. Um, parents are very leery of vaccines. These two brothers are very close, have very close genetics, almost identical. So this is the testing we used um, with him originally. Uh, we have a better panel now that's more uh, extensive through, um, through my office. But first, the methylation SNPs. We looked at these first. Yeah, the methylation SNPs here. One thing I'd like to stress to everybody that genetic tests, again, like diagnostic tests, like doing lab tests, like doing spectra right. cell, they give you information so you can make better informed, more informed decisions. Uh, hate to say it, but there are some statistics out there that show there's over 12 million misdiagnoses a year in our medical community and over 250,000 unnecessary procedures. So the more information we can have that helps us decide whether what a person needs, the better. In the case of methylation, I like to call it a stepladder. I know there's a fancy name, methylation cycle that uh, doctors are typically familiar with or they learned in medical school, but like most of us, they'll forget things that we learned way back when. So methylation is a, is a big step because that tells you whether a person is getting fuel to the body. I just did a, a, what I called an onboarding, which I talked to the parents this morning of a 16 year old. He was diagnosed as being depressed and I'm not sure I even like that word because yeah. what is his real problem? His real problem was he was, he was just tired. He was tired, didn't have the motivation, uh, couldn't really get going. And we checked his methylation and his methylation was very poor. It's one of the lowest I've seen. And so now we know how to address him. And if you're tired, just like if you're not sleeping well, you're going to be depressed because you don't have the energy. So if you're, uh, but that's why I don't kind of like these, once we put a label on somebody, then we tend to jump to a drug. Right. And so as opposed to what kind of nourishment can we give this person? So this is methyl B12, adenosyl B12, um, uh, MTHF, 5-MTHF, which is a certain form of folate, things like that. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. Though this, remember, this is a one-year-old, and, and normally using the approach that I've been diving into and you've kind of taught me, this probably isn't where we would start with this child, but this just came up first as the second page. So. Right, and we know, we know in advance what this person, this child, could face in the future. Right. And as, you, as we'll see a little bit later, we have even a more severe example of a six-month-old. What I love about it is that we can identify these risk factors early on because we all have mutated genes. We have a lot of them. Some of them are acting poorly, some aren't, but some of them could act poorly in the future. Right. So I love the fact that we can prepare in advance uh, for to give basically defenses, like in this case, methyl B12 right. or methylfolate. Sometimes it's not that complex. Sometimes it's a food supply. Right. Another correct kind of food, like you, like we talked about last night. So, mm -hmm. so um, I'm going to go through these genetic um, descriptions of each one, so you know why we talk about them. This is the Fuller 2 genetic error, and it, it helps mediate the Fuller 2 enzyme. Uh, helps mediate delivery of 5-MTHF, and that's a really highly methylated form of folate. 
uh, to the interior of the cells. And if it's, um, if it's down, if it's damaged, like it is in this case, remember it's, it's heterozygous, so it could be down you know, 40% or, or 30% or 50%. Um, it's only gonna deliver half that amount then. Yeah, I've seen people, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I like to call it a step ladder because kind of people understand that right. they're trying to convert a form of folate to a form that the body can actually use, right. the five methylfolate. So if these, if there's certain step, uh, if they're mutated, they're broken. So you're trying to crawl up a ladder that has missing steps right. or broken steps. Um, the kid this morning was a classic example. Uh, his was like, I don't know, by the time you get down to what he could really methylate or get fuel to the body, the mitochondria, or even to produce glutathione. They're really little. Yeah, antioxidant, yeah, right. very, very little ability. From homocysteine, so he had, probably had a high homocysteine level. Yep, yeah. you do a blood test too on him. So this is Fuller 2, uh, information on that. Um, this is the MTHFD1, which he is a homozygous for. Um, you see a lot of neural tube defects with these parents um, when their child has um, MTHFD1 or the mom does. Um, and then MTHFD1, variants of folate and choline metabolism genes and the risk of endometriosis, you get a high risk for that. Um, it requires more uh, choline, you get neural tube defects, like I said earlier stuff like that you can look all this up on your own well, as you look at these genetic errors of your child or or of your loved one or of yourself so and this is it here um so it can't it, it misses the step of of taking the uh the uh, 10 formal thf to the 510 methyl tetra methylene tetrafolate which is incredibly critical it's what feeds the mthfr process so um the whole methylation process so Essentially, you can kind of shut that down, or at least it's probably 90% down in this child, or 20, or 80%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it was consistent with his symptoms, which is the tiredness, the fatigue, the mm -hmm. motivation, because he apparently was a good tennis player. He, had, he was an interesting case, too, because his mitochondria, which the methylation feeds to the mitochondria You're talking about fuel. the 16-year-old. Yeah, now. the 16-year-old in this particular case. And he had all, they typically have all the classic symptoms. I think I mentioned to you one thing that I think is really cool about this is of all the people I've tested, and I've probably tested so far over 160 doctors and a number of individuals, needless to say, and all of them have been consistent. Their symptoms have been consistent with their genetic tests. So that's just telling me that the genetic test that you are using is, is validated. I <laughs> it's agree. It's very reliable. It's very reliable. I totally agree. So more on the MTHFT1 catalyzes one of the three sequential reactions in the interconversion of one carbon derivatives of tetrahydrofolate. Uh, which are substrates for methionine, di dimide I'm going to say this, I'm going to get this out, dimethylate and de novo purine synthesis. So essentially they can't really convert the, uh, the met into methionine or any of those other problems or, or sorry, any of those other things that we need. So this is more on the MTHFD1, so you know all the things that can occur from it. Neural tube defects, spina bifida, and encephaly. Um, my Myelomeningocele, sorry, cer um, cervical spina bifida aperta, all that. Bad news. Yeah, I'm not as smart as Dr. Purser, so I like to use a ladder analogy, and then I use the uh, ingredients to a cake. You're missing steps here, you're missing ingredients. Right. And so that's not working. The body's not working well. Uh, mm. Some people may never have symptoms, by the way, because they're, they happen to be eating the right types of foods that give them folate. But an uh, example I like to use is when I was, had my clinics back then, my daughter turned out, we didn't know anything about genetics, by the right. way, back then. Yeah, it's only been recently. Um, so we started, the, but then later on we started testing. But I knew enough to know, actually from your book, by the way, oh, thank on you. methylation, that a lot of people had methylation issues. So I said, well, if they have methylation issues, we need to give them methyl B12 and methylfolate. So all of our patients got methylfolate and methyl uh, B12. The good news is my daughter had homozygous and very low methylation, and so did her husband when we tested wow. them. And they had no symptoms. Why didn't they have any symptoms? Because they were already given the proper nourishment. Hmm. Good. Yeah, eating correctly. So this is MTRRA66G, and we're back to a similar type problem. It um, it just screws up the entire methylation sequence. Methylation mainly the way you need to think about it is taking um, the easiest way to think about it for humans is that um, you, we can't use sugar directly we have to convert sugar or carbohydrate molecule to ATP. And if you have a decrease in your 
in your ability to methylate, either through MTHFR or MTRR or MTHFD1, you'll create fewer ATP. So the crude oil, which is from the ground, which is the sugar, can't get converted to the ATP. And instead of 32 ATP, you might create 11 or 9 or 8 ATP. And you'll always be behind, always be tired. And that child will always be tired, always behind. So, and if I may say something here, it's kind of interesting. Another thing I love about methylation is that a person could be eating the right foods and eating very healthy, but without methylation, they have trouble breaking the nutrients down to get into the cells. Bingo. So that's the main point. So you say, well, I'm eating all the right food. Why, why do I still feel like this? Well, it's probably could be because maybe you're a poor methylator. Yeah, and you're not creating enough ATP. Yeah, and, and a lot of that tends to go to fat too. So for the heterozygous c 6 7 7 t uh, I'd give a milder form of an MTHFR base support, something with folinic acid, um, something like this, MTHFR support plus, but certainly not this for a baby. It's a much smaller version. We are coming out with a, uh, with a uh, chewable child's version of that uh, that, can, that can be quartered or halved, much smaller dose. Um, plus, all the start errors have an impact upon this child's B12 and folate absorptions and utilizations. It's just kind of a mess. I would not start with this, though. We're going to get to why you start with this child. Well, my grandkids are six. Well, they were six and eight. He just had a birthday the other day, the seven-year-old. But I use a cream form of B12 and folate that I have my daughter rub wow. on their backs at night. That's and it works cool. real well, and they, they think it's kind of cool. Okay, yeah, so there's all kinds of options. We're going to talk more about creams and, and liquids and oils and things like that. So this is kind of an idea Can you, you know, for mercury detoxification. It's just an interesting meme, but... Um, if you have um, two of the C677T mutations, and this child has one, remember, so uh, you'd have a 90% um, decrease in your ability to get rid of, to detox from mercury, because your glutathione essentially is not being reduced or made or converted from homocysteine. Same with the others. I'm one of the A1298C, so I, have, I store 30% of the mercury, but not now, because of everything I do, so gives you an idea so refer back to this take a screenshot of it that's that child so considerations on the on the methylation stuff from this child open the capsules of okay of the empty torch or plus or try the chewable tiny bites we're coming out with um stay tuned yeah they'll be out in the next week or so or they're probably out at the time we uh, play this video so or try liquid b12 and liquid folate drops and you can give tiny amounts even rub it on topically um or, or we'll try and give you a link to the cream uh, you can t tell more how they're doing after they get a little older, two to three plus, too. It becomes a lot more evident. Yeah, one thing I'd like to make point out, too, is that there's a lot of consumer testing companies out there. This is more towards the health professional. Right. Um, they'll test the methylation, and they'll tell a person, I saw that with my son, by the way, who did a test, and they said, you don't have any methylation. You don't have a methylation problem. And the reason was because they only tested the 667. Right. And the 1298, now in his case, neither one of those were mutated. Right. But he had several other mutations. So it's kind of like, okay, I have this ladder, but those two steps are there. Unfortunately, I'm missing the other four steps. I'm still going to fall on my butt. <laughs> Correct. Well said. So this is his um, vitamin D transport mitochondrial, which is really pretty good for this young little no, kid. No, that's actually a really good one. Yeah. He's got NDEF, uh S3, uh, which... Um, Decreases, you need more CoQ10, more BioPQQ, uh, possibly more magnesium, more calcium, but this is so minimal that I don't know if, if I'd even worry about this. So uh, I do talk about NDEF here. Um, you can't make enough CoQ10, but he's only heterozygous, so he might need a little CoQ10 someday, maybe a little BioPQQ, but it'd be a tiny amount, if at all. Yeah, if you don't mind going back to that slide, one comment I would make is, Another thing I really like about this test, because like the, the young man this morning that I was uh, working with his parents, he had a perfect mitochondria, actually. He yeah. had no SNPs at all. But the reason I say that is because notice Audrey. on this test that there's no highly recommended products right. because uh, it wasn't felt that this person necessarily needed to be treated for this. So I love this test in a sense, too. It tells you what you don't need. You know, let's focus on the things that are that we need, but not on the things we don't need. Mm -hmm. So, like in this case, I said that's not an area we have to worry about. So, I, I love that that it tells you also what you don't need to do. Well said. This is the neurotransmitter page. He's actually homozygous for GAD1, which is not a good thing. Well, so no. 
yeah, I mean, that kind of raises my radar, you know, now that I've had so much experience with these, um, this particular form of testing and this approach to this, I'd probably maybe even start here if it was an older child with bad anxiety issues. Yeah, GAD1 is probably becoming one of the most significant discoveries. <clears throat> what uh, I've seen now in a young child like that, of course, you're not going to see the symptoms right, probably. Right. But what you typically are going to see is, uh, what it is, by the way, is the body's supposed to convert glutamic acid to GABA. It's supposed to be in homeostasis. It should be balanced. The glutamic acid is neuroexcitatory, so it gets you going, gets you motivated, gets you doing things. But then the GABA is supposed to also calm you down, so you have a homeostasis or a balance there. So what I see in here, and I've, a lot of adults, including a lot of these doctors, sometimes they can be workaholics too, by the way, yeah. but often they'll have ADD different than the ADHD. And sometimes they'll be more susceptible to alcoholism and also with uh, drugs because your brain is kind of on fire. So they don't ever get it calmed down. So what happens, you will see, is that they're okay in the morning usually, but then in the afternoon they have a crash. And I hear this a lot with the adults. And then in the evening they can have trouble turning their brain off at right. night. And so they can have trouble sleeping. So this is an incredibly important gene to know about. And early on, if your child has that, that child may, we always say may, may be at risk for ADD, may be at risk for experimenting, uh, may be at risk for addictions, and definitely might be at risk for the sleeping and things like that, and the anxiety. Uh, so this gene here is, I, I just, I love it. We always treat it in phase one, by the way. Right, exactly. It's very important it's to treat. Start. Yeah. Especially if it was a teenager or adult. And this child, we'll, we'll look more at GAD1 here in a second, so we kind of, so you understand what, what, what we're saying and why we're saying what, what he, and why he said what he just said, but um, GAD one's a big deal. I just saw a patient the other day and on her um, new tracker, she had eight GAD one homozygosities and her anxiety is through the roof has yeah. been her whole life. It must be unbearable. And so the an so answer is we give them antidepressants. There's over 4 million kids in this country that are be treated, by the way, with just antidepressants, not counting other drugs. Right. And it, this, or, yeah, or, or do we know what the real root cause, as you say? What's the root cause here? The root cause is their body's not converting properly. So we need to help them convert. Right. And, and we can do that naturally. Yeah. 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 So let's look at this. <laughs> there it is, GAD1. Uh, so good, GABA is the body's version of Valium. That's what we make that yeah, calms us that. down. <laughs> right, yeah. So glutamate needs to be converted to GABA by GAD1. Glutamate being high causes anxiety. Glutamate, glutamine, whatever, uh, causes anxiety and, um, and almost uncontrollable anxiety the more GAD1 errors you have. There's GAD1, there's GAD2, and there's GAD3, but they all kind of deal with the GABA to glutamate conversion. So, um, wow. And if I may make a comment out there, a lot of, some of you ladies may be taking progesterone. <laughs> Uh, progesterone is one of those hormones that actually helps you right. uh, increase GABA. Oh, awesome. Okay, well, yeah, I give a lot of progesterone, natural progesterone to women. That's why a lot of times they say, wow, ever since I got on that, I feel real good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. We know how that goes. So do the husbands, by the way, because <laughs> the wife usually is nicer. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> we better, better cut that out. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't get irritable to move. <laughs> okay, well said. <laughs> Okay, you, the, she's always nice. <laughs> the last time I did a video with someone, I, uh, I, we're, it was our niece, and I was talking to her about her dress size and stuff, and I have been so ripped for doing that. I'm like, wow, you're down from like a, whatever she was to like a four, and it was just not the right thing to but say. I have to add in, my wife's been on progesterone for 18 years, and mm -hmm. I love her to death. <laughs> my wife too, so we're, yeah, good job. <laughs> okay, okay, this is back to the GAD one. Uh, so I already know about it. It helps, uh, it helps catalyze the production of gamma amino butyric acid, which is GABA from l glutamic acid, which is glutamate. So GAD1, while well, GABA molecules are inhibitory transmitters, glutamate is an excitatory transmitter. It's really important that you get this concept because your kids come up with a GAD1 a GAD error or multiple GAD1 errors. Um, GAD1 is only expressed in the brain as GABA molecules, which cannot pass the blood-brain barrier. And uh, I don't know if I agree with that because I take GABA too at night and um, it definitely passes my blood brain barrier. So I definitely feel it. Um, and so there's GAD1, there's, um, I know there's various versions of GAD1 and GAD2 and GAD3. So like, cause that lady had, I think everyone possible, so. Yeah, sometimes it's important for everyone to know because if you're given someone that has this GAD1 
or just has that anxiety and depression, ADD. Sometimes if you give them GABA, it actually converts more to glutamic acid, yeah. so they get worse. And that's why in that ProGAD enhancer that you saw just a few minutes ago, that contains uh, phenyl beta, beta phenyl, phenyl GABA, which right. is the only form that doesn't convert to so um, glutamic acid. Doesn't nu so Nutrascriptors, not that I'm involved with these guys or anything, but uh, Nutrascriptors has the yeah, they, ProGAD they have the They have the ProGAD. Yes. Okay. Do they have the cream version of that by any chance? Uh, they don't. Uh, the neurobiologic company does. Okay. The, the the father of the real product. So right. that's Kendall Stewart's Dr. Yes. Stewart's company. Uh -huh. He's amazing. So he treats a lot of ADHD, lots of autism. Um, he treats all pretty severe cases actually. He's like the major genetic MD in Texas. Isn't yes. He? Yeah. He's awesome. I, Kendall Stewart's amazing. I, I I hope to one day walk in his shadows. Like right now, I'm just kind of crawling along still. So. Um, so you really you do a mancitine liquid to make calm if needed, but I don't know if I'd use it in a one-year-old. I'd probably wait and see how anxious they really are. Is this really turned on? Is this a problem? So watch it and see. So, so why do we do a mancitine for GAD1 or genetic anxiety? Let me roll through these really quickly. Um, we already know that uh, glutamate is uh, excitatory and calming neurotransmitters GABA, so, and it bounces the two. Well, there's a trapping channel. Uh, there's a uh, something called the M, M, sorry NMDA um, channel, and um, and amantadine blocks it, so um, glutamate doesn't form, and um, more GABA forms. So, um, and this is just various articles on that. If you want to look these up and and know more of why we use amantadine like we do, it is a prescription item, and uh, yes. sometimes can have a negative effects. I've had a well a psychiatrist doctor recently who loved it. She told me that when she started doing that, her patients loved it. But she had a few that had some effects. But sometimes you have to be careful what other medications you might be taking or something else that may be going on. Uh, but overall, it usually works well for most people. Yeah, so it's got to be cautious. That's why I'm like, I don't know if I'd use it. I definitely wouldn't use no. it in a one-year-old, but it's something you got to have on your radar for later in life for this child. And we haven't got to the real problems yet with this genetic panel. We're coming to it, though. So more information on the glutamate and GABA systems, just so you kind of know. And help, and amantine helps with obsessive compulsive disorders um, and pain management, too. So now you see why we might suggest compound amantine cream for a small child, meaning four or five or seven or eight or nine or 10 or 11. And Not always, necessarily and always remember that we're are, are, we tend to default, I guess, to healthy eating. Right. Uh, Thank the you. problem is there's so much confusion out there about healthy eating. And I did talk to, uh, again, one of the doctors that I did a genetic test on the other day, and he was already doing all the right things. So even though he had these mutations, he said, I'm, you know, intuitively I've been doing the right stuff. He's been eating the right food. So right. food is always going to be probably your first line of defense. And then supplementing with supplements. That's why they call it supplements, by the way. Yeah. Uh, where if that's not quite enough, or maybe your food supply is not uh, as healthy as it could be. Well said. Yeah. And my followers love all that. So, um, well, here we are, really to the crux of the problem: the neuroinflammation section, uh, CD14, IL5 homozygous, CTLA4, IL13, TNF homozygous. ATG12 uh, for um, homozygosity for the autophagy, which we're going to talk about. Um, wow, this kid kind of got it here, didn't he? Yeah, he not only has very aggressive inflammation, we kind of interesting because we know it's kind of considered in medical field anyway that is a precursor to most chronic diseases. Right. But also, once you turn on inflammation, if you have trouble turning it off, that, that means the immune system stays on heightened alert. So instead of being released out there or acting to get rid of a virus or bacteria or something, it stays on. And then when it stays on, that tends to lead to those autoimmunity diseases. It also can lead to cancer in more severe cases. Now this kid here, child, again, we're looking for the potential future. Right. And also maybe, I know there's a lot of dispute about vaccinations in some areas, but we do know that vaccinations can cause inflammation. So I'm working with a, one pediatrician who likes to get it, all her kids tested first before she puts a schedule out there. She still does vaccinations, not as many as they always recommend, but she does some, but she wants to make sure, does this child have a, a high risk for like, for example, inflammation? Right. Are they gonna be turned on more and then can I turn it off? If you look at this particular report, the uh, CD14, the IL-5 is homozygous, so very aggressive inflammation once it's turned on. 
The IL-13 is another uh, marker, right. and that's an on-off switch, so it turns it on, but also turns it off. But what's really significant here, too, is this child has a CTL-A4. That's probably the most significant off switch. And this person is homozygous, so they're going to have real trouble turning off inflammation. Right. So that puts them in a higher risk category for maybe reacting negatively to vaccinations, for example, or to anything that might cause inflammation out there. Sugar could cause inflammation. Bad diet, grains can cause inflammation. So a lot of things can cause it. How do we turn it off or how do we keep it under control? We know things like omega-3s, curcumin, and things like that always help. CBD oil has been shown to help with inflammation. What I love about this, though, is that now we, can, we know this young, I think this is a young male, yeah, year, one year old, I talked to their parents, and in this particular case, say, here's the things we just want to watch out for the future. We want to start making sure that they have a low inflammatory diet. Again, going back to diet. Right. Uh, we want to watch multiple vaccinations on the same date because that just increases the risk of infl inflammation. Right. Uh, so those are the things Space that gives us out. notice. Yeah, it right. just, just gives us notice. And that's between you know, the parent and the pediatrician to decide that. But if the pediatrician has this information, again, it's more information that they can use to make informed decisions. So this is something you should and could take to your pediatrician and show them this and say, I want to space these vaccines out. Uh, let me go through why CD14 and why L5 and why IL13 and why TNF cause inflammation, why CTLA4 is a problem. So tons of inflammation, that's right. First, with two homozygosities and three heterozygosities, this is a massive amount of neurological inflammation, though I've seen worse now. I think the one we're going to look at later actually yeah, has six worse. Month old, right. Yeah, the six-month-old. And just, so, re, just a reminder, I think people out there probably already know this, but homo, homozygous just means you have a mutated gene from both parents. Heterozygous means you have one mutated gene from one parent. Thank you. Yeah, and that's in our primer videos, so... IL-5, the protein product of the interleukin-5 gene, is important for normal development of B lymphocytes and eosinophils. So essentially, his, his B lymphocytes and eosinophils can't mature properly. 90% of them can't, probably. So he can't fight off um, viruses and, and, uh, and uh, oh, um, what am I looking for? Right, any kind of virus, any kind of infection, any kind of inflammatory, even food. Right, allergies. Allergies. Uh, allergies would cause a massive amount of inflammation. Yeah. So, so uh, in inactivating mutations in the IL-5 gene, which is what he has, are associated with susceptibility to certain viral infections and increased aggression of the inflammatory response. These polymorphisms, these genetic errors, these mutations are also associated with increased aggression of allergies, asthma, and eosinophilia. Eosinophils would be parasites. That's what I was trying to think of just a second ago. Sorry, Mike. Um, parasites, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, they're, more, they're more likely to maybe get sick or at least less li at least get, if they do get sick, they tend to be sicker longer. Longer, yeah. Because yeah, their immune system is not as is weaker, especially with that ctla 4 So if you vaccinate this child, they're going to stay inflamed longer, especially that, that day where they give the nine vaccines. It's going to be a yeah. real inflammatory Problem it's for a lot kidding. of attack on the immune system, and in once it's day. turned on, it may not turn off. Yeah, yeah, for, for months or even years. So, cytotoxic uh, T lymphocyte associated protein 4, CTLA4, is an important inhibitor of T cell activity. Like Mike said, it turns off uh, overactive T cells. Uh, this kid um, can't effectively turn off all his overactive T cells, though. Yeah, once it's turned on, he's going to have difficulty turning it off. But without treatment, I like to stress that, we now know that he has this risk factor so we can prepare in advance right. to make to treat, uh, deal with inflammation so Properly. he doesn't have this problem. Right, yeah. and don't, don't get him super inflamed all at once and, and be more cautious. Maybe let him get a little older uh, on some of these vaccines, things like that. I'm not, being a, not going against him. I'm just saying space him out. Right. Be more cognizant of this error. So. And, and let your pediatrician know that these are risk factors that they need to take into consideration. Right. I know I had one, one young man I talked to. I talked to the parents, of course, but he, had, uh, he was on immunosuppressants and one, wasn't getting any better. So sometimes you also have to consider that, that if you're giving them immunosuppressants in some cases and they have this type of profile, that immune system may get worse. So uh, mutations in the gene that encodes for, C encodes for CTLA-4 are associated with a host of diseases characterized by a heightened immune state that cannot be turned off, like diabetes, like, 
like uh, diabetes, autoimmunity, arthritis cancer. issues, things like that. Yeah. So the heterozygosity CD14. This is lack. Uh, the lack is significantly associated with elevated IgE levels in pooled analysis. Again, causing increased inflammation. IL13 lack that prevents B cell eosinophil maturity. Wow, add that to IL5. Uh, his B cells and eosinophils are just kind of a nightmare. Um, this hetero error causes moderate inflammation, especially when viruses or viral particles like in a vaccine are, are present. Uh, tum the TNF is similar, causes inflammation uh, and associated with grave disease, Crohn's disease, asthma, COPD, et cetera, heart disease. Well, we now know there's over 100 autoimmunity diseases that have been classified and used to be not many. <laughs> and in part, that's gonna be related to the uh, inflammation and the foods that are out there that create inflammation. Even if you don't have a mutation, you can still create inflammation Mine. with your with diet. Yeah, with bad diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's IL-5 information on that. Let's break this down further. Uh, it's interleukin-5 and eosinophil. I think the best name for it is the eosinophil or, or beta cell differentiation factor. You can see that eosinophil differentiation factor in three down, the, the B cell or beta cell um, differentiation factor. So this gene encodes a cytokine that acts as a growth and differentiation factor for B cells and eosinophils. So he can't really mature his B cells or eosinophils. It's a problem yeah. for him. It could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, it could be. A, yeah, thank you. It could be a problem. Right. So let's be clear about that. So um, and so maybe related to the pathogenesis of eosinophil dependent inflammatory diseases. So best for him to avoid infl inflammatory events that are overwhelming. It's kind of like driving a car on high speed. Of course, he's not going to be driving a car yet, but he will be in the future. And having the engine run all the time, right. over time, it's going to wear out Great sooner. sooner. Right. Yeah, sooner rather than later. Yeah, so here's, uh, here's uh, T cells or uh, here's T cells trying to mature and they don't properly because of the IL-5 error and the IL-13 error. Here's more IL-5 information right down there. The, uh, the T cell here is, this is the eosinophil and basophil and IgE plasma B cells don't properly mature because of those two errors. Interesting, huh? Good pictograph. Yeah, it's great, it's great information. Like I said, the inflammation we know is critical, so you definitely want to test that inflammation part to know what risk factors a person's at. Right, what well, risk factor your child's at. So this is IL-5 as a central for vaccine-induced protection. Great study um, from uh, 2000. Treatment of vaccinated mice with uh, IL-5 antibody uh, suppressed both blood and tissue eosinophilia and completely abolished protection. I think it's an interesting study they did looking at IL-5, so. I have another doctor, a pediatrician, by the way, I know that actually what he does when they have some aggressive inflammation, besides not doing max, multiple vaccinations at one time and spreading them out and maybe not doing all the vaccinations, but uh, I know another thing he likes to do is sometimes he'll give an anti-inflammatory before he gives a vaccination 30 minutes before. So, That's smart. so again, just, well, it at least helps keep the inflammation down right. from the reaction to the vaccine. Yeah, I've seen that, and I've known pediatricians around here who do that. So this is interesting. CTLA-4 um, also uh, has a relationship with the cystothionine gamma li lyase gene polymorphism. That's the, uh, the gene that builds cystothionine for uh, glutathione production. That's interesting. So... Um, and it's definitely definitely been shown to be connected to cancer, but why is it connected? It's, oh, there it is down there. Because the inflammation. Because the inflammation. Yeah, good point. So here it is, better detail from, uh, it really blocks homocysteine uh, conversion to cystothionine. So, interesting. Canal. Methionine, of course, is critical to, just like methylation is, to producing glutathione, your number one antioxidant. And it could be anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 times as potent as vitamin C. Yep, more information on it. And CBS and glutathione and all that. Here's CTLA-4, um, not, not allowing cells to, um, to mature. They can't handle ethanol toxicity. Uh, and so break down a apoptosis or pop. So CTLA-4, this is a great diagram. I have no idea what it means. I just thought it looked really cool, so I'll just put it up here. For, for my viewing audience, so there it is. Just remember, he's gonna have, this child or anybody with that is gonna have trouble turning off inflammation. <laughs> and uh, that when considered with his IL-5 and IL-13, his, his white blood cell, T, his B cells and 
eosinophils won't ever mature properly. Yep. So why compound and low dose for naltrexone cream for genetic inflammation? Because um, you saw that where we suggested low, low dose naltrexone or LDN has to be compounded. So um, there's just a number of really good studies that shows it reduces inflammation. And maybe just a tiny touch of cream as this child matures to two or three years of age or four, so they don't end up with chronic inflammation. Um, just a number of studies that show how well it works. You can view these or take screenshots. Um, and it's been heavily explored and utilized in the pediatric community now. So in the adult community. Um, and uh, it's a tiny dose, especially with a baby or child. You're talking about a tenth of a milligram, maybe. Yes, uh, it's important to know that low-dose naltrexone in higher doses is sometimes people get it confused because if you went to a pharmacy and ordered uh, naltrexone, you would get at least minimum of 50 milligram up to uh, 300. Right. And totally different area. It's kind of like homeopathic medicine that sometimes you use a really minute dose or microdose of something and it acts totally different. And we've had great success with the low-dose naltrexone, too, uh, also for pain. I started like definitely to use more of it since I started doing this form of genetic testing. And again, using this particular approach to genetic errors in my office. So, And it's also a prescription item. So again, you have to, it's not something you're going to get over the counter and don't right. want to because you still want to be careful with it. So really, we've talked about the mantadine and the LDN, about the only two things here that are prescription on this in, in this yes. entire talk. Right. So um, now we're going to get into the ATG-12, the, uh, the autophagy-related 12. Explain autophagy to everyone. Yeah, the best way to describe autophagy is self-eating. Uh, the body naturally turns over cells every three to five right. days, except for in the organs. The organs tend to last longer. So you want the body to clean yourself out on a regular basis. Uh, proteins are breaking down. We want to recycle the amino acids. Um, I always re liken it to, let's say you have a house that you haven't cleaned for a couple weeks, or maybe your car, so the trash is building up, you haven't taken out the trash. Well, that can happen with the body, too. And if you're eating, by the way, on a, not only eating a lot, but eating s multiple times a day, you're also creating insulin resistance, and insulin is be shooting out, which also prevents the body from doing autophagy. So the body's not cleansing itself. So if you don't take out your trash in your house for a couple weeks or a couple months, think about it. It's not going to be good. Well, that's what happens to your body. So you want your body to be internally clean, different than detox, which is another area that, that basically your body's ability to fight off those carcinogens and those pesticides, herbicides. This is more internal process that the body does. And one of the best ways, especially for adults, is to do this is, so sometimes they get it mixed up, is uh, intermittent fasting. You turned um, me on to that. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing, I'm on about hour 18 right now. <laughs> you need something to eat? You, no, 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 I'm fine. You know, once you do it, you feel great, you feel better. I think we have some better. Twinkies or no, something. No, well, that would be the worst thing I could do. <laughs> I know. But anyway, that's so it cleans you out. So it's very important to know about autophagy, adults and children, of course. Yeah, I've been doing the same thing. I try to do 14 to 16 hours every night, so... Yeah. Great for weight loss, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, seriously, I've lost a lot of weight, you can tell. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, again, this article agrees with exactly what you said. Uh, autophagy is a process of bulk protein degradation, which cytoplasmic components, including uh, organelles, are, are enclosed in double membrane structures and essentially ejected so from the body. So I think that's interesting. Well, it's important for health, too, because, again, you want the new cells to be healthy. So if trash is building up and preventing them from being new healthy cells, that's why they also relate it to macular generation and also relate to longevity. It's a big plays a big role in longevity because you want to have new healthy cells. It's interesting, too, that ATG-12 is specifically involved in turning off the innate immune response. And mutations are predicted to lead to increased activity of uh, the innate uh, immune response and more inflammation. And this is another, kind of like the GAD one, it's one of those things that we're getting more and more information on, so it's probably going to play even a bigger role in the near future. Right. Um, because not only does it affect the immune system and cleansing and new healthy cells, um, but it just has lots of roles and things that we don't even know about yet. And the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2016. That's not that long ago. Wow. Before somebody, actually a doctor, a uh, Japanese doctor, won the Nobel Prize for autophagy. Wow, cool. Yeah, so, wow, really. This is showing how autophagy works. ATG12 ATG um, prevents autophagy uh, when it's damaged. Uh, autophagy um, is a pro Okay, we've gone through this. Autophagy is how you keep cells young and clean. 
Yeah, I think that genes basically, basically produce proteins and enzymes, and those are the signaling they tell our body how to function. So if you have these mutated genes, they're not, they're not able to tell your body how to function correctly. So you get an increase of almost a two-fold increase for hepatocellular carcinoma, increased risk of pancreatic cancer, because you can't get rid of these, the cell garbage in the insulin issues yep. too. So and you can't recycle your amino acids, so it starts to build up in there. So it's associated with all kinds of cancer, so. I don't know if anybody's been in New York, but Dr. Stewart likes to use the, use the example that if you've ever been in New York on a garbage strike, uh, that's what's happening when you have these mutations, or could be happening. Yeah, well, so and again, what's a nice natural approach? Intermittent fasting. You don't mm. have to have any fancy things <laughs> or fancy supplements necessarily. That's been proven to be one of the best ways. So a really clean diet for this little guy. Mm -hmm. As parents, just kind of a, something for the mom to think about as they And age. don't feed those breakfast snacks and those cereals and those things that they... Because uh, sometimes we're still in the mode out there where we think you have to eat several times a day, and that's, that's been proven to be so incorrect. So this uh, is interesting. Um, it's also associated with innate and antiviral immune responses. Back to his whole, is this little kid, you know, what's he facing with vaccines and everything? So, yeah. and now you know why. So, uh, IL-5 warn, warn of inflammatory reactions to vaccinations. Uh, and I'm, please understand this, I'm a libertarian. Parents can do whatever they want. I, I kind of disagree with some stuff, like some of the laws that are being passed in this country. So, um, but, but vaccines, uh, if you don't space them out, could cause some inflammation. This is his biggest issue. Um, so CTLA-4, he can't uh, turn everything off. So you could try a topical liposomal glutathione. Uh, that could help uh, remove some of the garbage. So, and also, like he said, intermittent fasting as he gets older. Um, ATG-12 is also autophagy uh, issues. This is probably the second biggest problem. Uh, you can't get rid of stuff. So uh, intermittent fasting again for that. Sorry, I think I misspoke, CTLA-4. I would not use intermittent fasting, but I'd use the, um, the some form of glutathione that works. So, yeah, I definitely, um, definitely want to use glutathione for that area. So uh, you could use compounded LD and cream for relief daily, especially as they get older. It's not a narcotic. It's not addicting. It just gets rid of inflammation. It's really simple. So um, now we can really dig into this. Another reason for them to eat a good diet, the ADRA 2A. Um, and more reasons to use glutathione, CTH, GSTP, uh, I-105B, heterozygous on those. Yeah, this is very important because, again, we're looking at this same six-month-old. And I've seen a lot of other kids, too. They're not quite as severe as this one. But that's why pre-warning or knowledge is so important. And, again, I keep stressing information. It's great information. This uh, ADRA2A, besides other things, the sugar sensitivity we know that sugar is very inflammatory. We still give our kids a lot of sugar. Unfortunately, at an early age, or we use synthetic sugars, which have a bad effect also. So because this child is so sensitive to sugar, if he's taking sugar, now he's creating more inflammation. Right. And he already has a great, so it's all related. And then the- The uh, gluten, avoid gluten and sugar. Right, and then he has the HLA DQA2 at the bottom there. So he also has gluten sensitivity, potential celiac, but all gluten is bad. So therefore that creates inflammation and also creates leaky gut. So these are all things that this child and I stress could face, but right. now that we know what his genetic profile is, doesn't have to face. Right, parents need to just train him. This is an issue. This is the team he's, he's been given. He's got to work with them and, and follow all the rules. So um, HLA DQA2, we're going to find out does some other things with um, mm -hmm with uh, T cells and viral infections. So get back to the immune system, get back to the inflammation. It's all connected. The more you know about your child or yourself, the better you can protect them. Well said, it's, well said that's why I have you here. So ADRA 2A, higher risk of sugar induced hyperactivity and worsening response to ADHD treatment with typical pharmacological interventions. So it's really key, like, uh, like Mike said, to avoid um, just, a, just sugary diets, sugary foods, all that. Like a sugar cookie for this kid would probably not be the, the wisest choice. So his HLA DQA2 uh, is gonna be responsible for um, inflammatory diseases like celiac disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, and gluten sensitivity. Now I have a child with uh, HLA DQA2, so I find that interesting. So um, here's the ADRA 2A, so you kind of know more about it. Um, uh, 
and so these kids tend to um, have much higher um, uh, consumption of sweet food products. They tend to be drawn to them, but it's just a bad choice for them. So, um, and they uh, they also have a uh, critical and regulating neurotransmitter releases from your fight or flight system. Isn't that interesting? Another reason to be anxious. So, yeah. Uh, or to be forewarned. <laughs> be forewarned. Yeah, for the child to be anxious and for you to be forewarned why. I was a lot so. more anxious about all these things until I ran into genetic testing, at least this type of testing that kind of identifies those clinically relevant genes that we can do something about. I well know said. Dr. Stewart likes to say that it doesn't do me any good to test genes I can't do anything about. I want to test genes that are relevant to clinical conditions, health conditions, and I can actually do something about them. Um, so it's just, uh, that's why I love this stuff. If you, you, you're not only, not only for yourself, parents, by the way, obviously I've got myself tested, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Purser's got himself tested, but you want to know about yourself too. It's never too late to improve right. on yourself. And with kids, it's just amazing information that you can use as evidence also. <laughs> yeah, well said. So childhood ADHD with the ADRA 2A again, um, CTH, which is in there. Um, again, it's going to affect your ability to make glutathione. GSTP1, which actually causes you to blow through more glutathione, use it up more quickly, uh, requires uh, additional glutathione for you to um, be able to detox. So you get rid of I'm gonna put a little plug in here, but you probably already, you all probably already know this. Dr. Um, Purser makes the best and most potent and FDA approved now, I believe, uh, glutathione. Well yeah, thank you. Yeah, so. so it and it's incredible. I use it for myself. We rub it on the kids. <laughs> And uh, you can spray it on. It's kind of interesting to spray. Sometimes people don't like the spray taste. Um, I it can works pretty topically much, too. I'm, I'm known for anything. So you just spray it on them. So lots of, lots of great uses. And again, remember, the methylation affects glutathione. Uh, another thing we didn't, if I don't mind, go backtracking just for a minute, because the neurotransmitters are also directly affected by methylation. Right. And methylation helps produce the neurotransmitters. And the glutathione. And the, well, of course, the glutathione for sure, but, but sometimes we forget about the neurotransmitters. Right. So sometimes people that may need something that helps them with, say, dopamine or some type of, we use natural products. I never use the drugs, by the way. And I've treated very, people successfully very well for ADHD, ADD, but you using natural, natural supplements that, amino acids that support. But then also, if you methylate properly, sometimes you don't even need those. Well said. I've also found. Thank you. So here's the uh, the uh, HLA DQA2. So this is binds peptides derived from antigens that access the endocytic root of antigen representing cells and presents them on the cell surface for recognition by the CD4 T cells. So his T cells, his CD4, and you and I have talked a lot about CD4 and CD8 T cells won't properly again mature. Right. Because they, of they this. won't have the protection. Right. So, but he could, he could, uh, yeah, well, we don't know whether it's going to, any of these are going to be turned on or off in this child. And we've certainly both seen that where right. we're like, I don't think this got turned on in you. So I've seen bad MTHFR cases genetically where they had no symptoms, no intracellular deficiencies, nothing. It never got turned on. So, um, for whatever reason, or they eat incredibly properly for what they've got and it's just never bothered them because of their diet and habits so um so and again hla dqa2 uh this last sentence that's underlined these cell surface proteins are responsible for the regulation of the immune system in humans i think that's pretty critical so uh adra, adra 2a is at risk of adhd cdh is going to need reduced glutathione uh he can't make enough that's problem number four problem number four again just DP1 cannot make enough reduced glutathione, uh, HLA DQA2 immune system problems, um, and uh, cannot properly key his immune system. Uh, IL5 um, warn of inflammatory reactions to the vaccines. Um, this is the bad gene in this case, I believe. IL5 and IL13 are really the most problematic one, and the CTLA4, um, CTLA4, probably two, and I don't, can't remember if I listed it here or not. Um, ATG12 um, cannot uh, create autophagy pre pre uh, appropriately. Sorry, I left out CTLA4 there, but this little guy's going to have problems with immunity all his life. Um, they may want to have him see an immunologist later, but I don't know if that would really help. But um, they need to follow the steps that we suggested. Keeping in mind, this is all going to change, and, and a little here and there, 
um, as time goes forward. It's already changed multiple times in the last four or five years as we've learned more and more and more about all this stuff. So um, it's just the best we can do for, yeah. for the moment. For this, yeah. November, th or sorry, uh, April 13th, um, 2019, it's just the best we can do, so. But the good thing too, we go back, I keep going back to diet because I, uh, we all play, you know, we know that plays an incredible role. Um, there are a lot of things out there that are put into foods, genetic modification, all these type of things that are causing, we think in a way, are causing a lot of these problems that we're having. But the advantage to a six-month-old, I mean, you all have had kids. I had four kids myself and two grandkids. So we know that once they get to a certain age, it's kind of hard to convince them to eat certain things. Right. So you got a six-month-old now that probably a lot easier <laughs> to put them on the proper diet and the proper food now than later. Okay, let's roll on here because we've got one more little quick case we're going to go through. So he has poor autophagy, so he cannot properly clean out cells. He cannot make enough glutathione. He can't make GABA, so some anxiety issues will need to, I, to remove glutamine. He will not need that later. He might need GABA or amantadine. Uh, he cannot reduce the glutathione he makes. Um, and so he's going to need to reduce glutathione. And he, he probably can't properly recognize all viruses. Uh, and also could have gluten intolerance. So, um, always space out all vaccines. Should avoid sugary diet, sweets due to hyperactivity. Uh, watch out when he gets viruses due to poor immune activity. Be aware of gluten intolerance possibilities. Let the boy live, but realize he's got some weaknesses genetically that you're just kind of going to watch over. Right. Yeah, and if I may stress here too, just something I, we all need to know about. If you don't already know, you probably do. Watch the antibiotics. Um, we see a lot of people that have taken uh, a lot of antibiotics and they always tend to have leaky gut or gut issues if nothing else, but that can affect everything also. So I just, again, be aware that that's a potential problem. Well said. So here's our little bonus case we're gonna throw at you. This is a six month old that you tested that really had some crazy results. Um, once again, IL-5, STAT-4, CTLA-4. He's actually probably in C3. He's actually probably worse than the child we just looked at. Well, he has both broken off switches. Um, so worse, you know, is kind of a relative, but uh, this is the one that we also saw, show the uh, sugar sensitivity, homozygous, and we also showed earlier on the uh, gluten sensitivity. So those are all inflammatory things. Then you combine this with his neuroinflammation. Don't forget it's neuroinflammation, so things like alumina can get across the blood-brain barrier and affect the brain. That's a question that's kind of been addressed by the autistic book and by others, but there's still still a question there. But either way, we know for sure that he has aggressive inflammation, and the STAT4 and the CTLA4 both are major off switches. And this child is gonna have, well, he would be more likely not to be able to turn off inflammation very well. So, so, there, so his off switches are broken, essentially. He's born major, broken. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you, and you combine that with aggressive on switch. The IL-5. Yeah, and he has both autophagy mutations too, so yeah, he also can't like cleanse himself out very well, which also creates inflammation when you're a poor autophagizer. Well said. My, very interesting. Whole different approach to all this stuff. So let's see what his next slide shows. Uh, oh, of course, he's got Adra 2A and CTH also. And he can't detox. Yeah, so he can't make... Very well, sorry. He really a poor uh, manufacturer of glutathione on a number of different levels. GSTP1 is also heterozygous, wow. And notice the things that make these things better, uh, therapeutics are natural products. <laughs> yeah. Glutathione, uh, there's no drugs listed in here. Right. Uh, that says this is how you treat this mutated gene. Uh, herbicide, pesticide avoidance, eating organic. Uh, those are things we all have control over. To a and point. this is stuff you can find out with a simple genetic test early on. I mean, six, this is six month old. We just had an even younger child there a minute ago. Yeah, I have kind of a, a philosophy now anyway, now that I know something about this a little bit. We're learning every day, of course, everybody. Right. We all are, but. And we I, share. I, I, yes, we definitely share it with everybody. We want everybody. The more educated everybody is, parents, everybody, the better off we are as a society. But the, the good thing about this too is that I think the people ought to be kids ought to be swabbed right out of the womb. <laughs> kind of exaggerating, but not much. I, I, I'm really, after looking at these two and some others I've done recently, I tend to agree with that concept. But it's never too late. Check your teenager, find out why they may be acting kind of funny or someone wants to put them on some kind of drug. And or they're it's incredibly anxious, which is a big problem I see around here. Yeah. Yeah. We had one, one young man, he was 14, and he was trying to join this group where he had to give public talks. 
you know, within a school group, and he couldn't do it. So put him on. Uh, he did great on the CBD oil. It actually allowed him to uh, get over his fear of talking. I'm not saying that's going to work in every case, but it's right. just things that you can do naturally that tend to help a lot of people. And, and that's interesting because I've been, after talking to Dr. Stewart myself, there's CBD oil and there's CBD oil yeah. that really works. That's super critical CO2 extracted. That's very high quality and creams and different capsules and things like that that really matter for a physician when you're looking One at the One thing you don't mind me pointing out here, I'd like to kind of point out that on this particular test, the way it's being done, you notice that you have the genes on the left and you have therapeutics. That means whether they have a mutation or not, these are things that nourish those genes because it's really all about nourishment. Right. That's nutrigenomics. And then um, over on the highly, there's no highly recommended products for sugar. You just avoid sugar. And then you have uh, lifestyle recommendations, in this case, over to the right. Same with the detox. Inosylcysteine tends to help somebody detox better. Right. And then if also, they can form glutathione. And the glutathione, of course. So now we're getting into the inflammatory environmental stuff, the FUT2, the HLA-DQA2, our old friend again. Here we go. Uh, FUT2. Um, Very important. Yeah. yeah. FUT2 is a is your your body naturally is supposed to produce what are called saccharides for the gut so the but the gut can populate good flora, good healthy bacteria. If you have a single SNP, that means a probiotic by itself will probably help you. If you have the double SNP, I use the example that if you're given probiotics, you're trying to grow uh, flowers on concrete. You need to fertilize it. So anytime you see a double SNP there, and again this person has all these SNPs, unfortunately that's why it's, we need to know about all of them because then you have to give them prebiotics. Now, prebiotics are, guess what? The best form is probably food form. Doesn't necessarily have to be a pill. What's your, what's your uh, uh, favorite food Anywhere form? from artichokes are good, avocados are good. What about uh, yogurt? Nuts. Yogurt, if it's not sugar-laden and right, like the, real like yogurt. the Icelandic yogurt. Especially goat those. cheese or something. Yeah. Goat from goats, those are probably the best because a lot of people have milk issues too. So it's important to know about that because sometimes you, you say, well, I gave my kid probiotic. It doesn't seem to be helping him anymore. Right. I gave my adult. And then you have the down there. You have the again the gluten sensitivity. He has the double double whammy there, which affects his ability to mature his T cells too. Right. So, what's well, the, what's the back. magic answer? Avoid gluten. So his B cells, the eosinophils, he can't turn off. Uh, he probably has difficulty turning off his T cells too. Another kid that should probably definitely have his vaccine spaced out and really careful with, with his diet as he grows up. Um, A lot of inflammatory potential there. Yeah, well said. The potential is quite high. So uh, these are the considerations that I kind of came up with after looking at this. Maybe later some compounded LDN cream uh, topically. Maybe later or even now t a tiny amount of CBD oil or cream at night for anxiety. Uh, Decarol inositol um, is a real consideration with this kid. You might want to go the pixie sticks uh, that you can get um, through neurobiologics. Um, and decarol inositol is just a mirror image form of inositol, which I found really interesting. But man, have I seen it help some of these kids with bad anxiety. Um, and avoid refined sugars and maintain a healthy gluten and lectin, uh, lectins-free diet. And um, pea soothe, which I brought some of, but they actually make a cream of it. This is through Nutrascriptives. Um, and Neurobiologics is another company that has it. Yeah, Neurobiologic um, treats VA soothe as an alternative to uh, uh, low dose naltrexone yeah. because for one reason some people can't write scripts <laughs> or get scripts so PA Soothe is a uh, it also can work in place of low dose naltrexone so you so find out which one works the best yeah to reduce inflammation and PA Soothe has um pomatol ethanolamide yeah I said it right pomatol ethanolamide uh, PA Soothe and they make a cream of it. Validated, absorbable, reduced stable glutathione, topical daily. Um, yogurt or, pro, sorry, prebiotics. <laughs> uh, remember the real high quality like Icelandic yogurt or goat cheese or something like that, or artichokes or something. And probiotics daily, a tiny amount. Remember, this is a, a, still a baby we're talking about here, so. Yeah, definitely start small on everything. Good advice anyway. Tiny amounts, yeah. My, you know, I, you hear me say that all the time. Start low, go slow. So, um, so some final thoughts. Um, if you do want this developmental nutrigenomic, um, myself, I'll discuss pricing. You can call us. I think I've got something on the next page about this. Um, if you want either Mike or I to interpret it, we're always happy to, or hopefully we've taught you enough that you have a pretty good idea. 
Um, and so you get a better idea. Some this is my final thoughts on this. Um, thanks for watching. Um, leave a thumbs up. We always like it. Uh, you're just paying it forward. Um, and this is the end. Well, really the beginning for a lot of you. Um, due to all the requests I've gotten in the last month or so since I said I was going to post this, you can get one of these kits from my office or go to my website and order a Pro 7 for for uh, children, or if you want to do it as an adult, there's an adult version. And it's super easy to swab the inside of each cheek for a minute. Um, and a um, minute each, you know, so two minutes total. Put it back in the tube, put it in the little silver envelope, put it in the mailer box, it's all included, and mail it. And 10 days later, we'll know the results. And we can go over, over them. Either we can mail them to you or email them to you. Or if you want to um, go through them with me or, or Mike, um, pay a little bit extra and we'll, we'll be more than happy to go through it with you. We're, we're just trying to help and we thought this would be a super interesting video for everyone. Yeah, you know, kids are our future, so are we. So the more we can do to help overcome a lot of the health issues that are out there now with these kids, the better. It's just, we all love our kids. We all want to do the best for them. So hopefully this is information for you, education for you. So ultimately your decision. I, I think this stuff's great. No, you're, you've been awesome. I'm, I'm so glad yeah, you flew thanks, up. Doc. I can't believe you did this. So just flew up to uh, get dinner last night. I know that's why you flew up. So, okay, no, thank you. We love you guys. Uh, you know my saying, God bless, go in good health and, um, and good luck. And I hope, you, I hope this helps someone out there. If we help one person, it's amazing. So bye.